Welcome to the Master's House. When I said that I
going to walk away. He's not going to walk away from his children. He's going to take us all the way home one of these days. He's going to keep his hand in our hands. Oh, we can't give up now. We can't give up now. We can't give up now. You know, when they walked around the mountain, when they came out of Egypt, oh, when they went into promise land, you know, they didn't give up, they just kept on. They didn't, they didn't fall in their walk with God. Oh, you know, we as Christians, oh, those of us that have given our heart to the kids, don't you know we gotta keep on? We gotta keep on walking. Whoa, you know I said I don't believe. I don't believe he's going to leave us now. Don't you know? Oh, yeah. He's not going to leave us now. He is gone. Ah, can you say praise the Lord? Come on. He's not going to walk away and leave you no matter what's happening. You may feel like you're walking all alone sometimes. You may feel like that you're just out in the middle of nowhere all by yourself in the desert. Uh, but you know what? If you just reach out and put your hand out, he's faithful. He said, I'm faithful. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Ah, uh, you know, he that keeps his hand upon yeah, yeah, Israel yeah, yeah, and the chosen people. He never sleeps, no, he never slumbers. He's there for you. He's there for me. He's there to carry us through. He's going to be there. You know, I said I don't. I don't believe he's going to leave me. I don't believe. I believe he's going to take me. You may be going through an illness. You may be sick in your body. But God is it. We got an entire book of every circumstance that you or I might go through. I'm telling you, there's nothing that he hasn't taken care of. He can heal your eyes like he did the blind man. He can heal your left to heal your soul just like he did last year. He can lift you from the sick bed. Oh, I said, I don't. I don't believe. Oh, I believe he's going to take me all the way. I believe he's going to do everything that he said. Brother Kenny, he's got a healing for your body. Praise the Lord. Those ladies that's walking around need their healing from these diseases in their body, this cancer. Oh, he's gonna take them away. Glory to God, we believe. You can't give it down. You gotta believe it now. Come on, come on, join in with me. Join in with me. Come on. I don't, I don't believe. That we would know 
His tender presence And we'd never be the same How could the holy be among us And not leave us changed? Shows up, tears fall down, feel his glory all around. Praise his name, praise him even now. When God shows up, tears fall down. Praise your wonderful name, Jesus. Glory and honor and majesty to the great I am today. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to do something today that's a little bit different. I hope it's all right with you folks. I want to spread a rumor. You, I can, I'll even allow you to say that it began with me. How's that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spread the... Hatefulest, meanest, ugliest, nastiest rumor that the whole world's ever seen. Huh? How many want to spread a rumor? Huh? Uh, Nobody wants to spread a rumor? Nobody wants to be guilty? I already said you could point your finger at me when they say, who said that? It was that guy. It was that guy. I'll be the guy that spreads the rumor. It's Brother Jeff. It's that guy. He's the one. 
I'm going to spread a rumor today. Oh, what a rumor it's going to be. Yes. And it's a rumor that's going to go from one end of this globe all the way to the next end of this globe as though a shot was fired out of a gun from one end of this world to the other. I'm going to spread a rumor that's going to light on fire the greatest revival in the name of Jesus that this world has ever seen. Praise your wonderful name. So that's Mountain Big Talk. I'm telling you, the power of a rumor can do anything. How many's ever heard a rumor today? How many's ever heard a rumor that was a positive thing? It's always negative, right? I'm going to spread a rumor today that the devils in hell are going to tremble at the name of Jesus today. Amen. Beginning with Luke, the fourth chapter and the 27th verse. This is a familiar story. Everybody's heard this story. This has been preached on. You already are going to know how it is. Brother Bill and Brother Hal already preached the message already in a song today. All you had to do is listen and reach out and receive. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Praise the Lord. Israel was full of lepers. Israel was full of people that were sick. Israel was full of people that needed God to minister to do something in their lives. And none were healed of their leprosy save one who wasn't even one of the children of Israel. It was Naaman. Go to 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Now here's something really interesting. The Lord, all capitals that we learned in Bible study, meaning what? What's that? Yahweh, Yahweh right? The divine sacred name of the Lord, right? Yes. The Lord had given him deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, and he was a leper. So here he was, great in the king of Syria's house he was the captain of the lord or captain of the host captain of the guard captain of the army whatever you want to call him the vice president in the kingdom whatever you whatever title whatever honor you want to put on this man he was that but he was a syrian and the syrians were the enemies of god think about that for just a minute they weren't even god's chosen they weren't even they weren't even a people that even believed in god they served their own God. We find out later on, they served Rimmon. And that's who they honored. That's who they sacrificed to. That's who they prayed to. That was their idol. That was the God and their religion and everything. Had nothing to do with the God of Israel. And he was a great man. It's so interesting to me that he was an enemy of God's people. We read a little bit further. He attacked God's people. He raided their land. He raided their provinces. He even took some of them and made them slaves to his kingdom, the kingdom of Benadad. Benadad was the king of Syria at that time. Isn't that crazy? No? Oh, I lost my place. And the Syrians, he was also a mighty man of valor, but he was also a leper. We're not going to take the time to explain what leprosy is, but it was a horrible, debilitating disease. Your body was full, covered with sores, and it was painful and hideous to look upon. But he was a man of valor, and God had given deliverance to the Syrians, given deliverance to the enemies of God by his hand. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel. Even God's children he brought, and all of a sudden there was one that was a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She was a captive. She became a slave. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Praise the Lord. Would God. Let me ask you that. Would God. 
Would God, how many times have we read in the New Testament where there's those that were sick and full of leprosy said, God, if you were willing, you could heal me and you could cleanse me of my leprosy. And what was Jesus' response to them? I will. Would God that my Lord, that Naaman could go to the prophet that is in Samaria and he would be delivered of his leprosy. We've already read that Jesus is testifying to the fact that there was nobody healed of leprosy in all of Israel. Nobody was healed. Let me say that again. Nobody was healed of leprosy. I'm not even fully convinced that this young lady even knew who the prophet Elisha was. I'm not even sure they were in the same hometown. I'm not even sure she saw him on the video. I'm not even sure they were Facebook friends. I'm not even sure any of that they ever had any contact whatsoever through social media whatsoever. But she said, would that God, that my Lord, who has stolen me away from my hometown, would meet the prophet and he would be saved from his leprosy. This is the rumor that I'm talking about. This little girl started a rumor and it shook the very foundation of the whole world in this guy's house. All you got to do is if you just meet up with this prophet. And she wasn't even talking to Naaman. She was too lowly. She just happened to be tending to Naaman's wife, whatever that meant. Maybe she was brushing her hair and the wife was so full of sorrow because Naaman had this bad episode that day that all the sickness and the sores just really brought darkness on his household that day. And it was just one of those horribly bad days of being filled with leprosy and it was just miserable. And because she loved her husband, her heart ached for him and just said something in passing as this maid was tending to her, maybe brushing her hair or doing her nails or who knows what. She's complaining about this leprosy on her husband and she says, oh, you know what? There's a, God, there's a prophet in Samaria. I would that my Lord would uh, meet that guy because he would rid him of his leprosy. Oh my gosh, we could spend two hours just talking about her, right? Let's move on, because I want to get done. Uh, then, then I find this is interesting. So she, she mentions this to uh, Naaman's wife. God were that the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him as leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the hand, uh, that is from the land of Israel. Somebody overheard this young maid, and I'm just picking brushing her hair. I don't know why. How many people love for uh, someone to brush her hair? Hmm? <laughs> brushing her hair, doing her nails, who knows what, tending to her. Oh, man, let me tell you, there's a God that we serve, and there's a man that believes in that God, and he could pray for him, and he'd be delivered of his oh, leprosy. Yeah. Wasn't even Naaman's wife. It was somebody else who maybe happened to be behind the curtain waiting for her to say she wanted something to drink so they could run in and bring her something to drink, right? I heard that there is somebody in Israel that can help Naaman get over his leprosy. That is crazy. Oh, I heard. Hey, I heard. I don't know if you heard this, but you know Naaman's got leprosy. And I heard that somebody can help him with that leprosy. Who? Somebody in Israel. So then brother Jeff, excited about the good news because he thinks Naaman is a great guy, happens to go before the king. See, he's on his way. <laughs> Isn't that how it starts? Although it's usually something horrible. I hear brother Thomas has got a wig on. He doesn't even his real hair. <laughs> huh? I'm just saying. Just so everybody know. <laughs> if I had a wig on, I'm telling you, it would be thick and luscious and not thin and where you could see through it. All right. That's how normal rumors are, right? I'm talking about a good rumor. And it gets all the way to the king's house. And the king gets excited and he calls Naaman and says, hey, guess what? I hear that there's a prophet in Israel that can help you with your leprosy. 
So now you have this young lady who believes, has no testimony. See, a rumor is something that's based on uh, no facts. You can't uh, substantiate it. You can't prove it. Uh, there were no testimonies of somebody being healed in leprosy in all Israel, Jesus said. Nobody was healed of leprosy. God would that my Lord would go to Israel and meet the prophet. And he would deliver him of his leprosy. And then the wife heard it. And then somebody else heard it. And then somebody else heard it. And then somebody else heard it. And it went to the king. It may have been finally that the word went from uh, uh, Naaman's wife who said something to Naaman. Hey, I heard this and I know you're suffering. And I know you're hurting. And I know it's horrible, bad. But, you know, there's uh, from the, uh, the children of Israel who you've been raiding. There's this young lady who helps me. And she's saying there's somebody there that can heal through the power of God, leprosy. And it went all this way, all on the basis of a rumor, an unsubstantiated story that God can heal. And the king of Syria said, go to go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, have therewith I sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Think about this. One girl, just talking. Can't substantiate it, but I hear you could be healed of your leprosy. One person believes. One person believes and look at the events that take place because one person believes so much that they say something. They testify to something that they can't substantiate. And then what happens? That second person that hears it, something begins to stir up inside of them. You want to know what stirs up inside of them? It's not faith. It's faith, but it's hope. Hope begins to stir up in the side of that second person who begins to tell somebody else. And what stirs inside of that next person? Hope. And what stirs inside of, let's go to Naaman, Naaman, hope. And Naaman, so much hope that, hey, I might be able to get rid of this leprosy. He goes to the king because the king is upset because he's suffering so much with this leprosy. I hear that I could be healed of my leprosy because there's a man of God in Israel. And the king begins to hope and says, not only do I hope, but I'm going to do something about it. Here's these pieces of silver. Here's 10 changes of raiment. And I'm going to write a letter. We are enemies with the king of Israel. We invaded their land. We did all of these horrible things to their people. But I believe the rumor from this little girl that God can heal. And God can heal you. Because what is hope? Hope is the desiring that you can have a change of your situation. That's all it is. Just an inkling. I don't have to be this way anymore. I don't have to suffer anymore. I don't have to be sick anymore. I don't have to be poverty anymore. I don't have to be in bondage anymore. I believe that God can change something in my life. And it began from a rumor. And these are people that don't even respect God. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Don't even honor God. These are people that aren't even gathered in the house of the Lord. Perhaps not even in the house of the Lord today. But because of a rumor that can spark some hope, lives can be changed. Amen. Amen. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and says, Am I God to heal and to make alive that this man descend unto me, a man of his leprosy, Whereof consider, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh the quarrel against me. The king of Israel didn't believe. The king of Israel 
had no hope. He is just seeking an occasion to come against me. He's already came against you. He's already taken people away and held them captive. But God was doing something wonderful here. Yes, he is. Amen. Amen. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king. Imagine how much it took for Naaman, who was an honorable man. He was captain of the army. He had great victories, God-given victories, the Bible says. And here he was having to come before his enemy, the king, his enemy, and ask for this thing. Think about that. I have some silver, I have some clothes, I have uh, a letter. Uh, could you, the king even ask for him, King Benadad, would you recover my servant Naaman from his leprosy? Think about what that took. And the king was like, Ugh. Jehoram, Jehoram was the king of Israel. Ha, you're just seeking occasion against me or rip my clothes and my God that I can heal and save. Can I make alive? But the man of God heard a rumor that Naaman was there and that the king of Israel, Jehoram, rent his clothes because the king Benadad had sent Naaman to be healed of his leprosy. And Elisha heard and said, tell Naaman to come and see me. Oh, that we could have the confidence in our God to say, you know what? Go ahead and come and see me. Amen. Amen. So Naaman comes with all of his horses and his chariot, with all his pomp, with all his circumstance, with everything that he has, his, his gifts, his silver, his letter, his changes of clothes, all this stuff. And he comes to uh, Elisha. And Elisha, the man of God, doesn't even come out to greet him. A servant must have went in and told Elisha, okay, hey, uh, you sent for Naaman. Naaman's out front with all this. No doubt, if he's got all this pomp and circumstance and all these horses and chariots, Elisha heard him coming, right? Elisha probably heard him coming. But here comes, we'll, we'll use uh, uh, Giza. That was his servant's name. We'll say it was him. He came out. I don't know if I said his name right. And... Uh, Go to Elisha, hey, uh, Naaman's here. Okay. Go back out there and tell Naaman uh, that I'd like for him to go and dip seven times into the Jordan River and uh, he'll be healed of his leprosy. Everybody's heard this story before, right? Put yourself in there. You are this great man of valor. You are important. And here, the man of God won't even come out and shake hands with you and, and, and exchange pleasantries and niceties and all those things. No, just go and uh, dip yourself in the river. I'm, I'm busy doing stuff. I'm busy. I'm, I'm doing whatever he was doing. I don't have time. Because you know why? It wasn't about the man of God. It was about God. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And God doesn't need anybody. God's big enough. God's great enough. He can do all things as he sees fit. Amen. Amen. And Elisha sent a measure and said, Go and wash in Jordan seven times that thy flesh come upon thee again, and thou shalt be clean. End of conversation. Matter of fact, there was no conversation. No great introductions. No great pomp and circumstance. Boom. You want to be healed? Go to this river and dip seven times. Naaman, I can understand where Naaman is coming from. He is wroth, the word of God says. He is angry. I'm ticked off. I'm upset. You wouldn't even come out and say hello to me, and you want me to go and do this thing? That he says that Naaman was so mad that he actually went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not these other rivers in Damascus so much cleaner and so much better than the River Jordan? Aren't they so much nicer, the ones of Damascus? And just even thinking about it, it says that he turned and went away in a rage. I mean, just I can understand why he's upset. 
I can understand why he is angry. But I want you to know something about my man, man, Naaman. He still believed God. He still had faith based on the rumor that he traveled all this way and that he is here in front of the man of God to be received of his leprosy because he believed the report and the rumor of this little lady. But now I'm upset. Because why? Because I thought. I thought that the man of God would come out. This is how I imagined it in my mind. This is how I think that God, the creator of heaven and earth, should do it. He should come out, the man of God, and wave his hand in a great pomp, in a great circumstance, and clap his hand down on the leprosy, and it'd be gone. I just thought, because it says in his word, that all I got to do is believe, and then I can receive it. And here I am, still a leper. Here I am, still sick. Here I am, still in bondage. Here I am, still in this situation. But I thought, all I had to do was this. And I thought, God, you should do it like this. Because I thought, this was the greatest way for you to receive glory. Because I thought, this is how it should be done. Who am I to tell God, I thought you should save like this. I thought you should heal like this. I thought you should deliver like this. I'm nobody. Who am I to tell God, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the one who can see what? The end from the beginning, right? The one who could see all things. God, it should have been done like this. And now I'm upset. And now I'm disappointed at you, God, because you should have done it this way. It would have been perfect. How many times have I, Lord, figured it out that it would be perfect if you would just do it like this? And I'm sure everybody would be shouting and dancing and having a wonderful time and it would be glory, honor, majesty, power if only you would do it like this because I thought this is the way, God, you should do it. This is the way you should heal. This is the way you should save. This is the way you should set free. I ask a question. Is it greater the end of Naaman's story than it was at the beginning? Yes, God healed him in his body. But as we continue to read, there is a change that was made in his spirit. And that is greater than any healing of any leprosy or any disease or any sickness or any bondage that God could set us free from. God, I thought it should be done like this. He still believed. Yes, he went away angry. But he didn't leave. Why? There is power in hope. Power like you can't even imagine. He still had hope. And in his rage, I would imagine those that were around him humbly went to him, figuring that he is, he is fit to be tied. And said, hey, uh, Naaman, if the man of God had asked you to do some great thing, give all the silver, give all this change of raiments, give all these gifts, Climb up to the highest mountain and pull, pluck a flower off the tallest tree and bring it down here. Would you not have done that? Yeah. Yeah, I would have done that because I thought that's the way it was going to be. Whew. No. If God is only asking you to come and dip seven times, why don't you do it? And because he still had hope, just because he had pride, just because he had arrogance, just because he had all these things, he still had hope to believe the rumor that he could be healed of his leprosy, that he went down and he got into that muddy river. Now think about, this is the highest honored guy besides the king. He's just been embarrassed, right? He's just been embarrassed by the man of God. He just threw a tantrum in front of everybody, right? Oh, how the Lord knows how to minister to us. He goes down and he gets into that muddy river. Finally breaks down his pride enough. 
humbles himself enough. And he gets into that river and he begins to dip. Now, what do you think transpired the first time he dipped himself down? Do you think he looked? I know I would look. (laughs) Right? Let's say it's right here. Oh, man. It's still there. Oh, man. I'm dipping. Why is it still there? I'm dipping. Lord, I'm dipping, and it's still there. Okay, I got mud in my eye this time. It's still there. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it's not true. I'm out. Maybe he almost got out of the water. I wasn't there. Because see, what was happening is every time that he went down, there was another layer of his spirit that was being peeled away so the ministering power of Almighty God could do a work in this man's life. And I'm not talking about healing him of his leprosy. Another layer came down. Was this the third time? Oh, let's get all the way wet. Right? Hey, I was baptized. And there was a dry spot. I've testified to you right here. Brother Don sent me back into the baptismal tank for uh, Pastor Paul to baptize me again. Some t- uh, I did the same thing to Brother Preston, who was, to be, who was baptized a few months ago. I left a dry spot when I baptized him right here on his head. And I told uh, uh, his mom and dad, said, hey, we got to get him. We got to get him down again. Don't let him get out of the tank. There's a dry spot. We're going to go 100% immersed all the way into the water. The word of God says that he dipped down. When you're going to dip down at the word of the Lord, are you just going to go oh, halfway? Or are you going to get down and dirty in that muddy water? Because what God is doing is a great, wonderful, cleansing work. Right? What is that? Five times? Lost count. We'll call it five. Six times. Woo! Still filthy. Still got this pain. You know, it hurts. It hurts every time I dip. It feels like I'm opening another sore on another part of my body. I've been doing this six times. The filthy water is getting into my wounds, right? But let's look beyond the flesh. Oh, what God was doing inside this man's heart and mind. All the ministry that was taking place into this individual. And then he goes down that seventh time. Oh, Lord, this is the seventh time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold for just a minute. I'm just going to hold for just a minute. And then he came up. And, oh, Lord, I don't want to be slow to open my eyes because what if it's still there? And he began to get the mud off of his eyes. And then he looks. And his skin is like a baby. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The leprosy was gone. He was cleansed from a rumor. Imagine what was going through Naaman's heart and mind. I would imagine, right? Whoa, it took seven times, right? It took him getting upset with God. It took him complaining to God. It took him to break down all of that pride and circumstance and pomp that he had. And he finally humbled himself and submitted himself and got into the dirty water. And God cleansed him and made him whiter than snow. Praise your wonderful name, Jesus. Get into the water. And Elisha, uh, wrong chapter. It says that he went down himself and he dipped seven times according to the word of God and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean. It wasn't the first time. It wasn't the second time. It wasn't the sixth time. It took seven times times based on a rumor that was unsubstantiable and he returned to the man of God and all his company and he said hey behold 
Now I know there is a God in Israel. I didn't believe in God. I didn't trust in God. I figured the God of Rimen was stronger than your God because I was uh, pillaging your northern country and taking you guys captured. But now I know there is no God like the God of Israel. And not only am I healed of this leprosy, but his spirit and his mind had changed. If you continue to read these scriptures, he says, I am going to sacrifice to no other God than this God. So much so that I humble myself in my position that I serve. And King Benadad, we have to go into the house of Rimen. I repent, God, that I have to go into this house and I have to help him get up as he kneels down because I'm only going to serve you God oh hallelujah I'm only going to serve you God you say well I've been dipping seven times I've been seeking God time and time and time again for this thing and that thing and then you're saying are you trying to tell me that there's no healing for me there's no healing for anybody except for some Syrian somebody who doesn't believe or know God who am I to tell can the thing that is formed say to him that formed it thus and so, and this is how it should be, and this is how you need to work your miracles, and this is how you need to save? Perhaps in my sickness, God is healing me in other ways that I may not recognize. Perhaps in my bondage, he is creating liberty that the captives can't even hold on to me anymore because I'm free in the spirit of Almighty God. Perhaps in my poverty, that there are so many riches that can't even be counted in the monies of gold and silver and changes of raiment that God is ministering inside of me. The word of God says in the book of John, there were those that were God's people, lawyers and doctors of the word, and the spirit of God was there to heal them that day. Yeah. Heal them. They were not sick in their bodies. They were not full of disease or anything, but the spirit of God was there to heal them. And there was those that had a friend who was sick and they opened up the roof and they lowered their friend down. And Jesus says, by your faith, by their faith, you're going to be set whole and your sins are forgiven you. I ask you a question. Is it greater that your sins be forgiven you? Is it greater that God sets you free from the spiritual bondage of this life than it is to be set free from those pains and leprosies and sicknesses and diseases? Jesus said, so though you know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins, I say unto you, rise and take up your bed and walk. I'm going to set a rumor today. There is nothing too hard for God. All I just want is for one person, one person to believe and testify. Even if you can't substantiate it, because hope is more powerful than anything else there is. John Maxwell said, where there is no faith, where there is no help in the future, there is no power in the present. Let me repeat that. Where there is no faith, and I'm going to say where there is no hope in the future, there is no power in the present. What does that mean? I don't know your circumstance today. I don't know how long you've been sick. I don't know, long, I don't know how long you've been fighting something. I don't know uh, your personal situation, but I believe this. And I have this hope that in your future, God has plans for you that you've probably never even considered before. Plans of blessings and plans of goodness. Plans of healings, plans of joy, plans of all glory. And if I can hold on to that hope, I ask you, what power can be at this altar today? What glory can be at this altar today? What honor and majesty can be right here today? Can you say praise the Lord? As everybody's eyes are closed, every head bowed. I don't want anybody to be looking, no peeking. Because I'm going to substantiate in your presence today that God is a miracle working God and that we don't have a false testimony that God heals and that God delivers. Close your eyes, please. Now I'm going to ask a question. 
And when I ask this question, I'd like for you to stand. Has God healed anybody? I'm going to close my eyes too. Has God healed anybody of cancer in this place? I'm going to ask you to stand. Has God healed anybody of a sickness or an affliction? I'm going to ask you to stand. Has God ministered to anyone in a situation and delivered in a great way or even a little way, but God made a way where there was no way? Has God forgiven anybody of a sin, great or small? Has God ministered forgiveness into your heart and to your mind? Has God ministered and blessed anybody with his spirit? Has God touched any, has he, or has he healed anybody? Has he delivered anybody? Has he set anybody free? Has he done any of the greatest things or any of the least of things to anybody? In the hearing of my voice, I'm going to ask you to stand and stand right now with me. I'm going to ask you for a substantiated testimony to open up your eyes and look to the left and to the right and see if anybody that God has not ministered to, that God has not healed, that God has not delivered, that God has not made a way because it's not a substantiated rumor. It's a testimony of the fact of the power in the name of Jesus. As the singers and musicians are coming forward at this time, I'm going to open up this altar. We invite the ministers to come. And I don't know where you're at in your situation. And you may be frustrated and you may be angry and you may be upset with God. And that's okay. Hold on to that faith. Hold on to that hope. Because God could still minister and move in your lives today. As we have a witness on the left and a witness on the right. And I spread this rumor to the whole world. God heals and nothing is too hard for our God.